It's time for this week's episode of Brandon Sports Talk, featuring in-depth interviews from those who are trending in the world of athletics. And now, here's the host of Brandon Sports Talk, Brandon Pate. Welcome back to Brandon Sports Talk. In today's episode, I have the privilege to interview a Canadian synchronized swimmer, Jacqueline Sw- Simino. How are you doing today? I am great, thanks. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Can you talk about how you knew that you wanted to be a professional synchronized swimmer? Yeah, I guess, um, you know, I didn't wake up out of bed one day and say, you know what, I want to be a synchronized swimmer. Um, I just knew I wanted to go to the Olympics one day. I remember watching it on TV with my mom and saying like, mom, I want to do that. That's so cool. You know, being surrounded by the best athletes around the world. So I tried a bunch of different sports when I was a kid, like hockey, soccer, baseball, basketball. And honestly, I loved everything. And then I moved from a small town in Quebec to a bigger city, Montreal. And that's when I really discovered water sports and my love for water. I know my mom would have trouble just pulling me out of swimming lessons because I just wanted to stay in all the time. So she registered me in swimming and diving and water polo. And one day at diving practice, I saw synchronized swimming, but now it's called artistic swimming from across the pool. And they were throwing a girl up in the air and she had enough time to do a backflip and a half pretty much. And I thought that was so neat because I was doing that off the diving board. Um, But, you know, little did I know these people that were throwing her up in the air weren't touching the bottom of the pool. So I was like, okay, mom, that's what I want to do. Register me in that. And so ever since that moment, I knew I wanted to be an artistic summer, a synchronized summer, and I wanted to go as far as possible. That's pretty amazing. How did you, of course, get started in organizing swimming? Um, just like in regular swimming lessons? Yes. Oh, ooh. Um, I think I always loved, you know, being in the bathtub from a young age, and I think knowing how to swim is something that's really important, at least to prevent drowning. So my mom always registered me in swimming lessons, you know, whether I was a kid, you the mom and tots in the water. And then I kind of just graduated from that into going to various swimming lessons and then um, discovered actual water sports from there. How did you know you wanted to do that versus freestyle swimming? Um, you know what? I loved both. However, swimming and just regular freestyle was a little bit monotonous. And since I was a kid, I loved doing a bunch of different sports and swimming didn't really bring me that variety that I really wanted. So artistic swimming, you have the solo event, the duet, the team event, and it constantly changes every single day and you do a lot of cross training. So that's why I picked and I lean more towards artistic swimming. Of course, how long did it take you before you got to the level you're at now where you're an Olympian? Uh, let's see, well, I started the sport when I was around eight or nine years old. And I went to my first Olympics at 19. So it took me about 10 years um, to get to that point to to achieve my goal. But I was quite lucky. I was very fortunate to be able to achieve that quite quickly. A lot of people are in the sport for almost 20 years and then finally get to uh, go to the Olympics. So I count myself very lucky. What was this, the 2011 season like when you went to the Pan American? Um, That was a blast that year. I had so much going on in Canada. We have what's called the Canada Games, So it's kind of like the Olympics, but, you know, within Canada. So it's multi-sport and each province. So kind of like a state for the states would have their team um, from a bunch of different sports and you'd compete. And Quebec, so the province that I'm from, actually won the Canada Games and I got to be the flag bearer for that. So I had a set of routines. So a routine in our sport is about three minutes long. And one routine has thousands of counts that you need to remember. So I remember, I had to remember um, three routines for the Canada Games and then uh, a bunch of routines for a national championship. So that adds on about four more. Uh, And then from there, I had to learn new routines for the the Pan American Games. And so I had a lot in my mind that year on top of school. So when I came home for, with some gold medals for Canada, I was just (laughs) incredibly pleased, you know, Um, it's nice to see hard work like that pay off. And that's, you know, thanks to amazing coaching staff that I was surrounded with and my parents and everybody along the way too. 
Of course, as you talk about the Canadian Games, what is that like versus, of course, the Pan American and the Olympics? It's quite similar, but on different scales. So the Canada Games is like a mini Olympics. It's neat, you know, it's multi-sport. You have a bunch of different sports. You have that village atmosphere. You have the cafeteria where you get to meet a bunch of different athletes and watch different sports. But of course, it's on a smaller scale. It doesn't get as much media attention. Uh, but, you know, it, it's a great taste of what a multi-sport game is like. But then you go to the Pan American Games, and this is all of the Americas. And for us, this is where we have to qualify for the Olympic Games, too. So it gets more media attention. There's a lot more pressure on our shoulders, too, because we need to qualify for the Olympics. And then the Olympics, of course. Well, it's the biggest competition in the entire world. Well, I don't think anything could beat that. I think, you know, 9.9 .9 people out of 10 that you stop on the street will know what the Olympic Games are. And I think that's so neat because so many different sports that don't get a lot of attention during a non-Olympic year um, get that attention at the Olympics. And I think that's an amazing part about any sport that gets to go to the games. What is that preparation like preparing for the Olympics? Well, you know what, this year was quite different uh, with COVID and everything, we, we added a year and we had to add a component of at home training when we were in quarantine here in, in Canada. Um, so normally, at least for the Rio Olympic Games, um, you, know, you, you start off by qualifying. I was fortunate enough to qualify a year in advance, and then you work on your routines, and you, you ideally trust your trainers and everybody to, to allow your body to peak at the right moment, which is the Olympic Games. Um, so with that comes a lot of swimming training, a lot of gym training, running, biking, cycling, weightlifting, um, so many different components of training that come into it. And the fun part about this is, uh, you know, it's kind of what my trainers are in charge of is timing this. So, you know, when to lift heavy weights in the gym, when to slow down, you know, the volume in the gym, but still lift heavy weights to feel that power. Um, and I have a lot of respect for what my coaches do because that's um, a really tricky part that comes into Olympic preparation. And I'm so fortunate that this Olympic cycle, we actually peaked at the right moment at the Olympic Games in Tokyo. And that's thanks to all these amazing trainers that I work with. What was it like in 2012 going to the World Juniors Championship? Ah, you know what? That was that great. Was great. <laughs> it was my first year being on a junior level. I was 15 years old, and there wasn't a lot of expectations set out for, uh, for me, to be honest. It was coming from my federation, coming from the coaches. It was more of a, you know, get some experience under your belt, and this is your first junior world. You'll probably have a chance to go to your second. And... Um, you know, I just had fun with the whole process. I got a 12 week training camp in Montreal and in Calgary beforehand, and then set off to, to Greece. And I really learned a lot getting to watch the best countries in the world at the junior level train before that competition, like Russia and Japan. And um, I got to learn a lot from their techniques. And I think thanks to that, and thanks to having some of my, my closest coaches with me there. I was able to come home with Canada's only medal at that competition, which kind of catapulted my career at that point too, to, to join the Olympic team and to go to my second junior worlds and, and beat the Russians who, who dominate in our sport too. So I'm really thankful for that 2012 junior world experience. What was it like going to the Brazil opening? Uh, so the Brazil open in 2013, that was such a fun competition, but not many people know the backstory behind that. Um, in Oh, 2013. I went to the Brazil Open twice so far in my career. So 2013 was the very first time I went to Brazil, Rio de Janeiro, and I was young. It was my first year on the Olympic team. I was 15, 16 years old, and I was just loving every single moment and soaking it all up because Rio de Janeiro was the host city of the Olympic Games in 2016. And I remember our pool and our hotel being a little bit more inland from the beach, and I just loved the beach, especially as a kid. So I kept on nagging my teammate, Claudia, like, Claudia, can we go to the beach? Can we go to the beach? But every day we would train and wouldn't have time. But the very last day after we finished competing and won a couple of medals, we finally got to go to the beach and experience some of Brazil's culture, meet some people, try some of their food. And I absolutely loved it. And uh, two years later in 2015, I returned to the Brazil Open with my duet partner, Corinne Thomas. And I returned actually five days um, after having my four wisdom teeth extracted. So I took a plane, a 10 hour plane ride from Montreal to Brazil, 
um, looking like a chipmunk and uh, couldn't really do much training beforehand in the competition. You know, a lot of my competitors were asking, like, are you okay? Did you get beat up? Because I was all bruised. Um, and I couldn't do much training, especially going upside down with the pressure of the water. And at that time, especially that year too, I had a stomach ulcer. So I couldn't take any anti-inflammatories to help, you know, break down that swelling. Um, but thanks to that preparation that I've been doing the months leading up to it, I was still able to pull off, uh, you know, some medal performances with my awesome duet partner, Corinne and, and Solo, and still come home with some medals, despite not having an ideal direct preparation for the Brazil Open. Of course, as you talked about the Brazil, what is it like to travel these countries? And of course, obviously, you're going to have to train, but what is it like to go out and visit them as a tourist? Oh, that's, that's the fun part. That's the cherry on top. Um, you know what? I do what I do because I love training. I love swimming. And traveling is just a bonus. Um, you know, so whenever we finish competing and we, we are fortunate enough to get a day off, whether it be in a training camp or after competing, it's so much fun to meet different people from all around the world, experience their cultures, try their food. Um, and I can't wait to be doing more of that too, especially now after the Tokyo Games and hopefully when more COVID uh, restrictions are lifted to go out there and just experience more of what the world has to offer. What was it like, of course, competing in Toronto, knowing that it's your home, like kind of city area? And what was that like for you? It was amazing. That was my first uh, big Pan American Games and Olympic qualifiers. And to be able to qualify for the Olympics in front of all my friends and my family and my home country was such a special moment. I will never forget that medal ceremony where the entire people in the stands were singing the national anthem with us. And I had goosebumps the entire time. I was speechless. I did not know how to react, how to feel. I was just in awe of that moment. And I could always just close my eyes and see myself going back to that moment to top the podium with my teammates and just feeling incredible. Of course, when you got to Tokyo and obviously with no fans, what was that like for you? I'm not going to lie. It was a little bit underwhelming. Um, I don't know if it's the fact because it was my second Olympics and, you know, there's always something special about your first Olympics and seeing those Olympic rings, but just walking out there and hearing silence and nothing but the flashes of the camera, it was a little special. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. Uh, but we're very lucky at our sport to, for it being a judge sport. So we had the judges there. I'm a big performer. I like drawing people in. I like looking at people in their eyes. I like fueling myself from the energy of the crowd. And unfortunately, I couldn't get all of that in Tokyo, but I still got a big chunk of that thanks to the judges that were present. And just the fact that when you have that moment at the Olympic Games, when you realize that you're surrounded by the best athletes in the entire world, that could motivate you to really reach your, your highest potential. So it was underwhelming in some parts, but so many parts just made it that much more special and unique too, because I don't think any other Olympic games, at least I hope not, will get to be in, in these circumstances. Of course, with no fans, were when you were performing, were you thinking more about the fans that were back home that you previously competed with? Honestly, no. When I compete, I have my blinders on. I don't really think about what's going on externally. I think about what I have to do in my performance and I'm in the present moment. So to be honest, I don't really think very much about everything else that's going on externally. It's only a couple of minutes after, you know, performing and going through the press area that I think, oh yeah, there, there was more to the world than just a swimming pool right now. What is it like preparing for each synchronized swim that you do? Um, it's different uh, because like I mentioned previously, we have different events. So there's a solo event, the duet and the team and each preparation for each of those respective routines are very different. Um, and team event, it's a lot of fun because it's energetic and we all kind of do similar types of work, different, but still similar. And you feel the energy together as a team. Whereas in duet, it's more of a partnership. You want to get on the same level, have like the same synergy before going out. And that's fun because you could feed off of one another. And then solo, it's just more free. So I kind of do a self check-in before each and every one of my performances and feel, you know what, I'm feeling a little sore today. I'm maybe not gonna hop in the water directly before competing. I'm just gonna go ahead and, and wing it there. And I thankfully I could do that now with all the years of experience that I have. In the past, I would be 
know, very um, religious on my uh, on my preparation. I would be, um, you know, I have to do my 400 meters and then my 200 IM and then my unders and I'd be very specific. But now that I have had a bunch of experience, I could kind of feel what my body needs on that specific day. Of course, do you know each performance before you go in or is it kind of like winging it and seeing what might work and what might the judges like? So duet and team are two performances and routines that are always set Uh, because you have someone that you need to synchronize with it. So it wouldn't be too good if one person just goes off and starts doing some improvisation. But um, solo routines are usually set in stone with your coach beforehand. However, um, I have some coaches that have a great amount of confidence in me. And, you know, sometimes I modify small parts of my routine, whether it be with a pool coverage, because I see that the judges panels are slightly different than other competitions or you know, the angles of some arm movements, just to make sure that I really get to connect with the judges. Um, so that's kind of the sole purpose of why I do change some purpose, some parts of my routine, or sometimes you're just more inspired <laughs> on some days than some others. And you feel your, your teammates on the outside cheering you on, and you, you want to give that little bit of extra. Can you talk about, of course, what a RBC Olympian is and what that means? Yeah, of course. So in uh, 2017, I was hired by RBC. So they have a, a call out for applications for Olympians after Olympic cyclists to take part in kind of a, an Olympian transition program, I want to say. Um, they have two types of job offerings. One is a part-time employment where you work 10 hours per week in the office and kind of department of your choice. Um, however, you're primarily in the marketing department uh, working in athlete management. And then the second type of job description that you can have is um, giving conferences. So I'm in the 10 hours per week where I kind of get the best of both worlds, because this gives me a taste of what it's like to work in the real world. Uh, believe it or not, you know, athletes like myself train 35 to 60 hours a week and don't get those opportunities to get some work experience. You know, I've, I've never really had a real job apart from training. So now I work closely with the marketing department here at RBC in Montreal, and I get that taste of what doing administrative work is like. But I also get the fun part about going to give conferences to RBC employees and partners about my Olympic journey. And I and I kind of fuse the values of RBC's values, Olympic values all together. And I get to share my passion for the sport and, and, you know, my love of life just with all these amazing people and employees at the same time. So it's an incredible experience. And I'm, I'm really grateful to be part of the RBC Olympians program. That's pretty amazing. What does it feel like to be a two time Olympian and have the Olympics behind your last name? It's surreal, honestly. I still feel like a 12-year-old kid um, just dreaming about going to the Olympics. And, you know, every single day, I don't walk out in the street and be like, you know, I'm an Olympian. But when I have people say or introduce me and say she's a two-time Olympian, well, that's just nuts. I'm like, are you talking about me? It doesn't feel real. I still feel like this 12 year old girl who still has this dream, who still has this passion about the sport. And it's, it's honestly surreal. It hasn't fully sunk in yet. What was it like the first time you got to put on the team Canada swimsuit to represent Canada? Oh, it was amazing. I will never forget the day where, um, we in Canada, at least for my first Olympics, we have two sets of Olympic clothing. So you have all your clothing that you get at the Olympics and that's like Christmas because you get a suitcase full of goodies and shirts and pants and everything you could ever dream of that you need. But then the actual stuff that's specific to your sport, like swimsuits, like you mentioned, I get that a little bit beforehand. So I got that in Montreal, I believe, before heading out to the US Open in California. And I remember trying it on and just, you know, you feel like a superwoman in it. I got two suits, one in red and one in black, and they're just so neat because they have the Olympic rings on them, a giant maple leaf, and you just feel so proud wearing it. What does it feel like to, of course, have the maple leaf and the Olympic rings on your swimsuit? It's really neat uh, because, you know what, we all have those hard days sometimes where you forget why you're doing what you're doing. And so to have these little emblems on your swimsuit, like the maple leaf for the Olympic rings, you just take a second and look down and see what you're wearing. And that's just a little recall of what you're doing and why you're doing it. It really reminds you of your why and your purpose of why you started all this. So that's, it's really meaningful to me. What is some of your game day routines and rituals like? 
So I have a few. Um, one of them is eating a chocolate before a chocolate bar before I go and perform. Um, and it's neat because I've had the opportunity now to travel to 37 different countries and know in which continent where I could get some of my favorite chocolate bars. So in Europe, I like my, my Milka, but in Japan, I like my Neji. Um, so it's different for every part of the world. And so I have that about 45 minutes before I go and compete. And then about two minutes before I actually walk out into the Olympics and actually dive into the pool, I have contact lenses. So I fill up my goggles with some water and I flip them onto my eyes and turn my head upside down or at least look up. And this sticks my contact lenses on so I could see in the water. Now this doesn't work 100% of the time, but I think I've had about a 98% success rate with that. And then the last thing that I do is I give my coach the biggest hug possible before going out there and competing. Of course, what are some of the plans after this previous Olympics that you're looking forward to? I recently got accepted into podiatric medicine. So I will be beginning um, next week, actually. So in September, uh, my schooling, I'm looking forward to um, these new challenges. I'm going to be doing my schooling in my second language, which is French. Um, and also the challenge of learning everything about the human body, whether it be about pharmaceuticals and, um, you know, everything that has to do with medicine. I can't wait. This has been another dream of mine since I've been a little kid. And it's surreal to think that I, I'm now going to accomplish my second childhood dream. What were some of your favorite memories and moments in this previous Olympics? Oh, there's so many. I don't even know where to start. Um, but I think one of the very first days when we arrived in the village, I was, um, I'm the veteran of the team. I'm the only returning Olympian. And so the first day I got to see all of my teammates' expressions when they just walked into the Olympic village, that little sparkle in their eyes, even though it was at some ungodly hour at night or in the morning, they were just so excited to see all the flags that were put up, the whole entire Canada building, and then their excitement of trying on their, their Canada gear. It was amazing. And it reminded me of my first experience at the Olympics. And I think that's one of my all-time favorite moments of the first Olympics. Or my, my Tokyo Olympics, I guess. Who are some players that you look up to and saw in the Olympics that you were like, oh my God, I'm standing right beside blah, blah, blah. <laughs> um, there's so many, but I think, you know, there's some people that I train with in Montreal and, you know, we're, we're all high performance athletes in the gym and you don't really pay attention to who you're, you know, lifting next to you. But I had Maud Shahal, our Canadian Olympic champion in weightlifting you know, do some snatches next to me. Now, my snatches were nowhere near as heavy as her jerks and snatches, but it's just so cool. I mean, I was in awe to watch her on TV. Unfortunately, we couldn't watch her in person, but just to say that, hey, I know her, like I train with her. Um, it's so neat to say that I could call her my friend, the Olympic champion. What is it like to, of course, see those people that you might have looked up to in the Olympics, like pre previous to getting there and now seeing them in the Olympics? It's pretty neat. Um, you know, I think back to my first Olympic Games in Rio and, you know, seeing Usain Bolt just dance on the balcony or, you know, pass him in the cafeteria or, you know, sit next to Michael Phelps for lunch and see Simone Biles in the, in the aisle for the cafeteria. It's, it's kind of cool, you know, to see them there in person and share this love and passion for sport and what we have in common. What advice would you have people looking to be professional water synchronized swimmers? I would say don't be afraid to go out there and ask for help, whether it be from coaches and to really listen to your coaches and the experts that are out there and really try and apply what they're saying. Because, um, you know, once you have that mindset, the sky is the limit. What advice would you have people that are looking to go into their first Olympics or whether it's their second or third, just like you? I would say try not to have many expectations going in to Olympic Games. Uh, you know, we always try and picture whether it be the ideal situation or you have these doubts in your heads with all these what ifs. Go into these games without really any expectations. Focus on what you have to do and not the expectations that come with it. That's wonderful advice. Where can my listeners find you at on social media? Yep, yeah, you guys can follow me on Instagram at Jacqueline underscore Simino, on Twitter at Jackie underscore Simino. 
Um, and you guys can follow me on Facebook um, as well. Thank you again, Jackie Simino, for your interview and best of luck in your future in the Canadian synchronized swimming. Thank you so much. You can find Brandon Sports Talk on Facebook at Brandon Sports Talk, Instagram at Brandon Sports Talk, Twitter at Talk underscore Brandon, and you can find me on YouTube at Brandon Sports Talk. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Thank you again, Jackie, for your interview and best of luck in your future. Thank you. You've been watching Brandon Sports Talk. Please feel free to like, share, and subscribe to Brandon Sports Talk on social media and on YouTube.